Thank you, Tucker. Can everybody hear me? That's good. It's great to be here. I want to thank Tucker for solving all the technical problems so that we get to do this show today. And I want to thank you all for being here and for supporting BirdFest. And it's my privilege to be able to stand here. I'm going to stand here for about a half an hour and talk and show you some pictures and give a bit of information. Then the program is going to end with a world premiere of a movie that's been one year in the making of hummingbirds uh, nesting. So it's uh, quite a big event for me. I've looked forward to this for a long time. <laughs> so I'm going to guess that since you're here to listen to a program about hummingbirds, that you've been at least smitten by hummingbirds, if not become addicted to them like me. They're, they're a really intriguing and wonderful family of birds. We're going to learn a fair amount about the hummingbird family in the next short bit. Uh, I have a story, a, a book with three chapters in it. The chapters are uh, a bit of hummingbirds in art and history. The second chapter deals with hummingbird geographic and physical diversity. And the third chapter is devoted to my favorite little bird, the Anna's Hummingbird, which will show up again in the movie. So we'll go on to chapter one. When I started organizing this program, I started thinking about hummingbirds and why I'm so intrigued with them. And there's so many reasons. Uh, the high energy, the beautiful colors, their attitude. I mean, there's so many different ways that strike you in terms of their character that I got, I need a word, one word if I can, or a phrase that characterizes hummingbirds. So I came up with a lure. The quality of being powerfully and mysteriously attractive and fascinating. And I haven't found a better word to encapsulate all the different aspects of hummingbirds as I think about them. This is a, a, a word map, or a word cloud, comes in a variety of ways. The size of the word represents the popularity of that word in terms of the different names of hummingbirds. Now, a little bit of technical detail here. Taxonomists, bless their hearts, break down the bird families into 249 different bird families. Hummingbirds are one of those families. Trochilidae, I think. I'm not sure how to say it. Trochilidae. All the hummingbirds are in that one family. They were separated from swifts years ago, so they have their own family. Well, it turns out that there are 352 hummingbird species within that family. That's a lot of different species of hummingbirds. That's using the Clements Taxonomy Guide. If you use the International Ornithological Congress guide, they have 361 species. So it's not a, not a pure science, I guess. There's still some debate about what goes where. There's a lot of birds. I generally don't think in terms of scientific names, you know, genus and species, but I do think about hummingbirds. In the United States, I think most of our, almost all of our hummingbirds their names end with the word hummingbird, right? Anna's hummingbird, Rufus hummingbird, broad-tailed hummingbird, black chin, hummingbirds. So that's why hummingbird is the most popular second name of all the different hummingbird species. It's the biggest word up there. But there's wonderful terms up here. Look at these other names. Metal tail, mangoes, emeralds, hermits, pied tail, incas, coquettes. There's so much poetry involved in the naming and the history of how people reacted to the first experience with the hummingbird and had the opportunity to name them. It just gets better from there. So a little bit of, about hummingbirds over time and a little bit about hummingbirds in art. Thirty million years ago, I wasn't there. 
30 million years ago, a clay layer formed in uh, Heidelberg, Germany. Somebody, many, many decades ago, collected a sample of that clay layer. And that sample sat in a storage closet in, uh, what do I say, in Hamburg, Germany, I believe, at a, a German ornithological institute sat there in the closet for decades. In 2004, the head of that institution brought it out of the closet, put it up on a lab table, and started dissecting it. 2004, he found fossilized hummingbird legs in a sample of stuff that was 30 million years old. That's, that's a long time ago. It's commonly thought now that 12 to 13 million years ago, the hummingbirds migrated, emigrated from Eurasia, came across the Bering Sea area, and started south down Pangaea until they got to Central America and South America, and there the populations kind of exploded. Back then, the climate was more represented by our current Mediterranean climate, Caribbean climate. So it was warmer. It makes, it makes it possible, right? So, but I think it was a surprise to me to learn that the hummingbirds may have originally started in Eurasia, in Germany, who knows? But it goes on. <clears throat> the Mayan civilization peaked out between 500 B.C. to 500 A.D., and they had a, a legend that the hummingbirds represented the sun. Now, that you can dive into that, but clearly the bright colors and the glittering aspects of it and the relevance to the sun probably assisted them in that transformation. This diagram on the screen, I don't know if you've heard of the... the group of diagrams like this, they're referred to as the Nazca Lines. They're in Peru. They were created somewhere around, I think, 1500, the year 1500. This is one of the many diagrams that is out there. This bird, its representation is 300 feet long. It's a football field laid out there in that time frame. Nobody really understands how they were able to pull this off so well. Uh, but that's it. The Incas in Peru followed up. They have a legend where the, uh, they, they sent a hummingbird to find out what was above the blue sky. It came back and said nothing. There you go. Today in, Ma in North American indigenous cultures, virtually every tribal unit or every group has something, a story or a legend or a fable involving a hummingbird. Most relevant to this location is this book, Red Star, Blue Star Defeats Specsman, which was written by Randy Lewis, a Colville tribal elder, a member, proud member of the Pascuosa Wenatchee tribe, and Bill Lehman. In this book, Specsman was a, a river-dwelling monster that devoured things and made created fear and, and did a lot of damage. A hummingbird was the first attack on the, on the monster when Red Star, Blue Star went to tame Specsman. The hummingbird came down and its one vulnerable point, one of its vulnerable points was its eyes. And the hummingbird blinded Specsman. So it's a great little book if you like to have local literature. Oops, wrong one. If I get rid of that, that's how I do that. We all know that John James Audubon produced a, a wealth of really wonderful, detailed uh, bird paintings and plates, 435, I think, total, two of which are shown here. Uh, and these, these two particular examples were created in 1833 and 1838. Audubon, I think, set the stage for bird artists overall. Uh, he's certainly the one that we know most. 
He was followed pretty quickly by John Gould, another prolific painter. And he actually has uh, the, the Gould's Jewel Front Hummingbird is named after him, I believe. <clears throat> but he produced another series of really detailed, complex, colorful, beautiful paintings. And then this fellow was relatively new to me. He's, his name is Ernst Heckel. Uh, he is credited with uh, discovering and identifying thousands, thousands of organisms around the United around the world, including Darwin's finches. He's the guy that told them they were the finches. He's also a guy that pr promoted uh, scientific racism. So there's that. So. Today, we know that uh, Roger Torrey Peterson and David Allen Sibley, Sibley was a, a keynote speaker here at BirdFest a couple of years ago. Hope you had a chance to see him. Both of these guys have created field guides that help thousands of people identify birds in the wild. Their drawings are referred as, you know, remarkably accurate, the colors are great, and they've just done a lot to advance our appreciation, our ability in appreciation of, of the birds we get to see. I picked up a bird book in Ecuador, which I thought was kind of uh, uh, maybe exaggerated, the title of the book is The uh, Field Guide to the Hummingbirds, Plates of All the Hummingbirds in the World. Well, there's 352 species, okay? And the book, like this, yeah. So the diagrams in there, they're, they're all color plates. They're good. It's, it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but they're all here. So that's pretty cool. But locally, and I mean locally, as in Leavenworth and around the Washington area, we've got some Tremendous bird artists in our, our grass. Here in Leavenworth, Lori Aylesworth lives somewhere on the icicle, I believe. Uh, her website, aylesworthart.com, she paints not only birds, but nature scenes. It's uh, a rather robust website and really very attainable price-wise. Uh, we have two of her prints in our home in, in Wenatchee and really look at them every day. I think, and I, I don't know this to be true, but my view of the, the artist, the painter around here who has probably the greatest notoriety, uh, particularly within the birding community in our valley is Heather Murphy. Uh, Heather is a longtime supporter of Audubon, one of the people I believe who thought up the concept of BirdFest when she was still employed by the, by the Forest Service. She's a great supporter for birds. She's a wonderful person, uh, and she's been very helpful to me as I study hummingbirds and try to talk about that in terms of keeping me honest. She's a wildlife biologist, and she's really good at uh, making sure I don't stride out of my fence. <laughs> so Heather Murphy. Her website is wildtales.com. Her business is uh, walleye cards. Uh, she has journals. The, the journaling aspect of Heather's experience is, is really robust. She's really a, a treasure. We bought a copy of this picture a few years ago, and I think it, it's hanging proudly in our home as well. And I think it really summarizes so much about hummingbirds. Uh, the fact that this little roof, Rufus, I believe, is sitting there on the scale, outweighing a crow and a raven, uh, largely because of its attitude, you know, I suspect. But I think that painting is really good. This is done by Eileen Sorg. Her studio is Two Dog Studio. She's over in the Seattle area. Uh, and again, she's all these things were used with permission from the artists. So I, I really appreciate their helping me out. All right, we'll talk a little bit. I'm going to give you a little bit of a break from my talking here, but we're going to talk a little bit about the diversity and the geographic range of hummingbirds. To start that out, which is chapter two out of three, we're going to, I'm just going to show you a, slow, a short slideshow 
The slides are going to go by every five seconds. Every bird is named. These are all pictures that I took either in Costa Rica or Ecuador. And just to show you the diversity of the kinds of hummingbirds around the world. And I ask you, please, to pay attention. We know hummingbirds are really important pollinators and that hummingbirds and plants have co-evolved. So pay attention to seeing pollen either on the beak or the forehead. Look at the variety of beak forms and shapes, lengths, and think about how that's applied to get that bird the nectar and the food that it needs to survive. So I'll just let this play, take a little nudge. Can everybody read the names? Pollen all over the forehead of that bird. Remarkably small bird. How's that for some feathers? One of the micro hummingbirds. This bird has is the second in terms of beak length to body length ratios. Who wouldn't like to see that bird in nature, huh? How'd it get the name Violet here, huh? These guys are thumb-sized birds. This bird has the greatest beak length to body length ratio of any bird in the world. Coronet in one of its classic poses. Mountain Jim. I mean, come on. <laughs> right? So let's talk about geographic diversity. I mentioned that the birds emigrated from Eurasia, found their way into the New World, the Americas. Today, all the hummingbird species are found in North America, Central America, and South America. That's it. And they're not distributed uniformly, right? Everybody, you, you can go to hot spots or you can take your chances. So let's take a look at where these birds are in the New World. So the, ver the horizontal lines are the Tropic of Capricorn, Tropic of Cancer, equ equators in the middle of those. So it pretty much paints a band for the tropics. In South America is where most of the hummingbird species live. The top contenders here are Colombia with 158 species, Ecuador with 129, and Peru with 126, and Venezuela with 103. We came back from a week in Ecuador, and I have photographs of 42 species of hummingbirds, and we didn't get really down into low elevations, so we, we know we missed. We have to go back. <laughs> you look at Central America, the number of species starts to decrease. Still, Costa Rica shows 54 different species. As we move away from the equator, the number of species declines. What I see in these, these numbers and the graphs are uh, a trend uh, for, there's all, there always seems to be more species along the Pacific coast or areas toward the Pacific and closer to the equator. So there's this gradation as you move north and east.
my punchline here is if you want to see hummingbird diversity, you got to go to the tropics. You're not going to do it in Washington or the United States for that matter. Mexico has 58 species. Their states are so small, I didn't want to clutter it up too much. It's already too small to look at. But the species are scattered around. But Mexico is, is widely known as a, as a hot spot to go uh, look at hummingbirds. 58 species, not bad. And there are, again, the higher number of species are located along the Pacific coast. The United States suffers badly in terms of numbers of species. Uh, Texas, Oklahoma, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California are the leaders. For the most part, when I started looking at, at hummingbirds around the United States, most of the references I found said, well, there's really only one species on the east side of the United States, and that's the rufous-throated hummingbird, I believe. Uh, but that's not really true. They're, the rufous hummingbird and occasionally a vagrant uh, broad-tailed hummingbird will get in there. So it, it's not, but the numbers are clearly skewed to the west and to the southwest. So Arizona is the place to be. Let's look a little bit about size differences. The first slide in this program was of one of these giant hummingbirds photographed in Ecuador. That's the largest hummingbird in the world. And the little guy there, the gorgetted woodstar, the woodstars are, are what I call micro hummingbirds. David Attenborough, I think, coined that phrase. That's the third smallest bird in the world. The bee hummingbird in Cuba, endemic to Cuba, is the smallest. And then the vivarian hummingbird is just a fraction of a, it's very close to the gorgetted. It's a nuanced thing. Let's have a little perspective. So these, these birds are, to the best of my ability, to scale. So the differences, I think, are pretty real. So the Woodstar is about the third of the size of a, of a chickadee. The giant hummingbird, in terms of length, if I could stretch the bird out in the picture, head, you know, beak top to the tail, it's just slightly smaller than the length of an American robin. It's bigger lengthwise than a, than a cedar waxwing. It's a big bird. The one we get to see all the time is the Anna's, of course, and it's characterized as a medium-sized hummingbird, which it is, toward the bottom end of the, the lower end of that scale, but that's it. We get four different species in north central Washington, right? We get the Anna's, the black chinned, the Calliope, and the Rufus. The Anna's is here all the time, and the other species are seasonal visitors. So I'm going to ask a favor of you. I tried to highlight the area that the North Central Washington Audubon Society claims. This is our turf. These are the four counties in our area, the, the highlighted area up there. Chelan, Douglas, Ferry, and Okanagan counties an area my friend Mark Oswood likes to say is just slightly bigger than Belgium. It's a big area. So keep that perimeter, that shape in your mind, if you will, because I'm going to show you some graph or some charts here that use that shape. I, I mined all the data in eBird and said, where have people seen these four species? So these dots, these little markers, show where people have registered eBird sightings for the four different species. So this is all four counties combined. And I just went in and had it tell me, where'd you find them? Because the, every, every bird sighting you put into eBird carries a latitude and a longitude, right? Uh, particularly if you're doing it from a mobile app. There's a couple of things here that surprised me when I looked at these things side by side. I'd not seen anything like this, and I started looking at it. And I, I'm startled because I'm thinking Anna's is the most popular and most common bird we have here, but it shows up with far fewer dots in eBird than the other species. I don't know why. They do seem to be concentrated along river channels, along the Wenatchee, 
and up the icicle and into the into the metal. But then the dots are just not there. Maybe people don't log Anna's hummingbirds and eBird. I don't know. The black chin hummingbird is well distributed across the whole area. But you look at the density of the dots for the calliope and the rufous hummingbirds, and the density is a lot higher than the Anna's or the black chin. So those two species seem to draw more eBird observations geographically and numerically than the other species. But I thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, now here comes a graph. It's okay, there's a takeaway. You don't have to know the graph, you just need the takeaway. So this is, again, based on eBird data for the entire four county area over time for each of the species. The upper left hand graph shows that the Anna's hummingbird is here all year round. We get to see them all the time. The other three are seasonal visitors. They migrate, right? So they're, they're here and then they're gone. We'll go into some of the issues around that here in a moment. So chapter three, the Annas, we're close, coming to the close here. The amazing Annas. And this, this chart, I, the next one I put in here is kind of a test and I'm not expecting great results here, but th this, the punchline here is the Annas hummingbird is expanding its range to the north and east. And the color splotches on here come from a scientific paper that shows that in the 1930s and 40s, the Annas hummingbird did not move any higher than the San Francisco Bay Area. Today, just this last winter, we had Annas hummingbirds in Stevens County in Colville during the winter. They're, they're definitely moving to the north and east, which is what this chart is intended to show, generalization north and east. We'll talk about that again in, in a second as well, like right now. Because Annas are here all year round, some of us like to feed hummingbirds and, and be entertained by them yearly. I like, I like hummingbirds in my yard all the time. So we feed hummingbirds during winter. That's a contentious position to take. Some people feel that's absolutely wrong. Uh, and most, most of the concerns about the, the being wrong to do that stem from the belief that if we feed them during the winter, we're keeping them from migrating. And that is not the case. If a bird is biologically and genetically programmed to migrate, Feeders or no feeders, they're gone when it's time. It's largely dictated by day length and temperature and food availability. But if they're gonna migrate, they're gone. The Annas has a proclivity to hang around. So there's some things to think about if you decide to uh, feed during the winter. First, you need to understand that humans have definitely influenced the distribution of Annas hummingbirds. We have planted eucalyptus along the I-5 corridor coming out of California, and that in itself brought humming, Anna's hummingbirds north. People like us, I'm, I'm guilty. I plant stuff in my yard. I put up feeders. I encourage hummingbirds to be there. So I believe that artificial feeding, backyard plantings, and climate change, the warming, are the three main factors that are really at play in terms of the Anna's expansion. We need to understand that we're involved in that. I've already said it, but I'll reinforce it. Feeding hummingbirds in the winter will not keep them from migrating. If that was the case, and we had feeders up, calliope and black chin would be there as well, right? Wrong. When I started, yes. Are they what? Hummingbirds are bullied everywhere. Oh, I don't know that that's the case. They're following food more than they're not avoiding 
danger. I don't think they're Apollo and food. And they're gone. When I started feeding hummingbirds, when I lived back in Portland, my, my dearest friend there, a great birder, uh, a real mentor for me, told me if you start feeding hummingbirds, you inherit the responsibility to continue. You can't stop. So it's, it's, it is a personal response, it's a decision each of us needs to make. But if you're gonna do it, you need to keep it up and you need to do it properly in terms of keeping feeders clean. Annas are gonna be here with or without feeders. So my personal position in all this is that having a feeder up doesn't put the bird at risk, I think it gives them an opportunity to survive. Uh, food sources are really limited during the winter, cold periods. So I think my feeders help get them through that dangerous period and into spring when they can uh, carry on. It's your choice, right? It's your decision. And if you go to the North Central Washington Audubon website, there's a hummingbird page and we've worked hard to put a lot of different references, pro and con, on there. There's videos about how to clean a feeder. There's scientific public. It's a good repository for all things hummingbird, particularly the, for, for those that are relevant to our area. So I encourage you to go look. Get informed and make your own decision. Wow, here's the scene. You're sitting on your back patio in the evening. It's May, or it's, it's, it's April. And you're having a glass of wine, you're watching an Anna's hummingbird female sitting in one of your bushes off to the side, protecting its feeder. And you hear this, Pop! and you see this bird go, Phew! and you wonder, what the heck was that? Well, it's a male Anna's hummingbird coming down. They do this display dive in front of the female. It's their attract, one of their methods of attracting the female's attention. This is amazing to me. There's people that study this stuff in great detail and they, and they publish things. So here we go. The male starts out by climbing about 100 feet in the air, right? And he hovers up there and he looks over and makes sure she's still there. And then he tucks his wings and he starts the dive. It's not a random dive. It's very purposeful. He orients his body into the sun so that his feathers have maximum iridescence that she can see. Think about that. As he gets down toward the bottom, he emits his tail flares and he emits what I think of as a hummingbird scaled sonic boom. It's a chirp. <laughs> it's what you hear, chirp. And another Astounding statistic, at the bottom when he pulls out of the dive, he's pulling nine Gs. Most, many jet fighter pilots black out at seven. So this bird is really enduring uh, a lot. He may stop and go back and forth in front of the female. What do you think? How am I doing? But then he climbs up and does it again, right? All right, here's a little math. Don't, don't panic. We all know this. We think velocity is, is distance over time, right? We think of it in miles per hour, feet per second, kilometers per hour, meters per second, that kind of thing, okay? So we're all familiar with the term velocity. But it's all in how you describe it. The units are important. This, this when I encountered this, I was just, it took me several months to, to really believe this. And Anna, male Anna's in that dive will go somewhere between 70 and 85 miles an hour. That in itself is pretty astounding, right? That's moving right along. But if you describe it instead of miles per hour, you, you think of it in terms of body lengths per second. Anna's hummingbird's about four inches long. That's 85 miles an hour, you can do the math and it comes out to 385 body lengths per second. And this is in the literature. This has been credited in Scientific American and a lot of the esteemed British publications. It's, it's real. High-speed photography and acoustics. Who knew? So, that's pretty incredible.
I first encountered that statistic in this book by John Dunn called The Glitter in the Green, great book about hummingbirds around the globe. And he made this claim that the male anise is the fastest vertebrate on earth. I'm going, wow, that's a big statement. Body link specific fastest vertebrate on earth. So I dug into that a little bit and he's right. Well, what's the fastest bird we think of? The peregrine, right? Okay, the peregrine can hit 200 miles an hour on its dive, on its hunting dive. That's truly fast, truly fast. It's 207 body lengths per second. I thought, well, how about a Formula One race car? Not a vertebrate, by the way. I thought, well, let's, just for comparison. So I did the math on that. 27 body lengths per second. Having a high-speed, high-performance motor is not a help if you want to be a record setter. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, Tucker, here's the big moment. I'm going to transition here to a movie that's 10 minutes, 10 and a half minutes long, and then I hope to have time for some questions, okay? Okay, Tucker, it escape. 